today in your clinical settings, coming back to where we started. You have osimertinib, osimertinib with chemotherapy, and amylase. Walk us through the treatment landscape and how are you making that treatment decision? That's a, it's, this is a tough question that comes up every day. These are long, long discussions with my patients. Um, <coughs> it's, it's rare that I have a patient where I think all three options are truly reasonable, um, but it, it does happen. The patients that I consider for osimertinib alone tend to have thoracic only disease, um, very low symptom or kind of lower risk disease. Um, you know, osimertinib by itself works really fast. So I feel comfortable using it if patients have, you know, pleural effusions or other types of thoracic disease where they need a quick response. Um, but the CNS data for the intensification is very compelling to me. So, you know, though I know osimertinib works great in the brain, I think the durability of that response is really important. So for patients with risk factors like that, particularly CNS disease, and, you know, many patients present like this, um, I'll choose to intensify therapy. Um, certainly patients with um, negative CT DNA, I think that they tend to be at baseline, tend to be much lower risk. And, um, you know, I, I would choose osimertinib for them. Most other patients, and we saw this from Mary Post, about 80% of patients have one of these high risk risk factors, right? So either CNS disease or positive CT DNA or liver METs or TP53 commutation. Um, and so I'm really more often considering the, the, the combination regimens. Um, their side effect profile is so different. Their toxicity profile is so different. The management of them is so different that it's, it's not that common that I, it's really a, a toss up to me. You know, I often have a patient that can't take anticoagulation or that is already cytopenic or that, you know, doesn't want chemotherapy. Um, and so I use all of that to kind of offer these two regimens. And then I, I really leave it up to the patient. I discuss the toxicity um, and management of both. You know, the data looks very similar. So it's, it's hard to push for one or the other. Um, you know, and I, and I kind of walk them through. A lot of patients are really um, excited about the chemo-free regimen. Um, and they're really scared of the cytopenias and the kind of chemotoxicity. But a lot of patients really worry about the infusion schedule or um, of amivantamat, which for now is more intensive than, than the flora too. Um, a lot of patients worry about the cutaneous toxicity and how to manage that. Um, and, and I kind of help them decide. Right. Well, it is a difficult situation indeed, especially when tri uh, three options are available. Estella, how does that conversation take place on your end when deciding between the three here? So I think that one thing that we're learning from the data as more data comes out is that there is something uh, that happens that you could change the disease course of a patient in two ways. We know that only a third of patients make it to second line therapy. So we have heard a lot that maybe you just do these therapies in sequence and then everybody gets the most they can get from osimertinib, and then they move to the next option and the next option. But that is not the real world. Our patients can progress really quickly. When they progress in the brain, it's very hard to salvage that situation. So when I have these discussions and we talk about toxicity, I kind of put my, my goal in survival. And, and also, if, the, if that's the goal for the patient, I think that that's the, what we're trying to discuss. You know, what is the regimen that is going to give you CNS penetration, that is going to prevent resistant uh, mechanisms, and could potentially sh change the course of your disease for the longer. And then when can you tolerate toxicity better? You probably are better equipped to do that early on in the course of the disease. So I favor patients who want to be very proactive, who is all, they're all about survival. They really should consider the amivantanab regimen for all the reasons we discuss. And there are going to be, be those cases where patients cannot participate. They cannot receive anticoagulation. They really don't want to come in to the cancer. They only want to come to see us every three months. So those patients are going to get monotherapy with osimertinib, which is still a great regimen, and we could definitely do things in the second-line setting. But I do worry about those patients with high burden of disease who are very young and they want to do everything. You have to present this data. And I think our job is to just make it in a way that they can tolerate it and get the most benefit of all these options. In the real world evidence or in your practice, how this combination has uh, sort of worked out for the CNS metastatic disease? Yeah, I, I was actually very compelled with the Flora 2 and, and the um, Mariposa data. I mean, I think this is the major cause of morbidity and mortality for these patients, and they're terrified of brain metastases. So I think um, that is key. And I think, you know, with 
uh, the, the data that we saw, in particular Flora 2, there was not just a prognostic benefit of this escalation, but it was predictive too, where we really saw that the hazard ratio was lower for patients with brain metastases. And so I think, you know, you, you can't deny that synergy. Um, and, and it's definitely something that, like as Susie said, that's one instance where I really push for uh, combination therapy.